Hello and welcome to Let's Talk with Bishop R.C. Blakes. R.C. is an author, empowerment teacher and the proud pastor of the New Home Ministries of New Orleans, Louisiana and Houston, Texas. His message circles the globe. His conversational and candid approach to challenging content makes him a relevant voice to all generations. Get ready for a life-changing transformational conversation. Well, hello, family. This is your pastor, R.C. Blakes, Jr. And I am so excited again to be able to share with you. Um, I'd love for you to invite someone to come in and to join in to our conversation, Bible study, lesson, whatever you might want to call it. Um, people need to be in uh, for this one today. I was sitting and pondering what what should I talk to you about today? And the weather was so beautiful. I said, well, I'll go try and sit outside. And um, the Spirit of God dropped this in my heart. Understanding the tragedy of having a wrong relationship with money. I see so many people that get sidetracked because they develop a wrong relationship with money. And what is the what is the first thing in life, you know, before we grow up and before we actually mature and before we live a little bit of life, our first inclination is to believe that Somehow, money is the answer to everything. You know, the, it's, it's just the epitome of life. The Bible does say that money answers all things, meaning what? It's like a tool that solves a lot of problems in the natural. But if you're thinking that money equates to quality of life, if you believe that money uh, equates to happiness, you're sorely mistaken. You know, you look at how many of uh, your movie stars or your politicians or your, 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 music, your, your music people that have all of these millions of dollars and are on the verge of suicide. They're, they're not even in their right mind. And they have more money than they or their children's children could ever spend. It's because to believe that money somehow is the answer to all of your life's issues and that money somehow is going to bring fulfillment to you and that money is going to make you happy is starting off on a wrong foundation relative to money. And if you go to um, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money itself, but the love of money, the inappropriate relationship with money is the root of all evil and then it goes on to say which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows I remember one of the first conversations my father and I had when he released me to go and uh, to establish the church in East New Orleans. He said to me, in, in no uncertain terms, he said, make certain that your focus is always on taking care of God's house and God's people and never allow yourself to get to a point where you're motivated by the blessings that may come your way as a shepherd. He said, Take care of God's house 
and trust God to take care of yours. And uh, that set my, that established my mindset relative to money and my relationship to money. Uh, I guess my father could, you know, really, well, I guess it was, well, I know it was, should I say, just the wisdom of a father preparing a son for real life. You know, I guess my father could see way down the road and could see where God would bring me and how I would have to have this as a staple in my mindset, lest I would run aground. And, and so not long after, um, you know, what was, the, I guess it was, yeah, it was years. It was years after we established the church. I never really made a lot of money at all uh, in terms of a salary of any kind. I think um, I think I made like seven hundred and fifty dollars every two weeks. That was at my that was at my <laughs> that was at my peak in terms of a salary. And um, the Lord told me to go off of salary and to trust Him with love offering. And I, you know, not, not long before got married, Lisa and I were married, and and um, I went off of went off of salary. We had some other things we needed to do in terms of building staff and doing things. We needed to build a building and all of this kind of thing. And uh, can I tell you, God has never failed me. Even through a pandemic, because I've had always had the right relationship with money. You know, my first relationship is with God and then God established you know, my relationship with money, I, I've never been a man that coveted money. And I, I thank God because that was due to proper fathering. My father established that in my heart as a value that a man of God is not supposed to run behind dollars. If you do what God has anointed and called you to do, money will never be a problem. But you. You cannot wake up and find yourself in a place where you have this love for money because it seeds all evil. And he goes on to say, while some coveted after it, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now listen to how 1 Timothy 6 and 10 reads, in the message version and there it says lust for money brings trouble and nothing but trouble going down that path some lose their footing in the faith completely and live to regret it bitterly ever after how many men of God have you seen broken down to nothing because their motivation was money. They had made money their God. They had made money their God. And I'm here to say this to you, and I hear the Holy Spirit. You must get your relationship with money proper because what God has in store for you will not be able to be delivered until your heart is in a right posture concerning God first and everything else after that. Relationships, so forth and so on, and then coming to a place where you have a proper relationship with money. See, God will not give you something that you cannot handle. Now, the question is, um, how is it, how do we get drawn into lust for money? How is it that we get drawn into lust for money? I think it starts out for a lot of people, probably most, most people, it starts out innocently. And by that I mean there's a letter A. How do people get drawn into lust for money? Letter A, there's a real concern about natural needs. It, it, I believe it springboards from 
a sincere and honest concern about one's natural and very real needs. And you get caught up in, well, I need this and I need that and I need money for this. And before you know it, all you're thinking about is how to get a dollar, how to make some money, because it starts out very sincerely. It starts out with your concern about your very real needs. Now, if you go to Matthew, um, eh, where am I going here? Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 and 25, it says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, money. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? When you keep reading the full context, he talks about how God takes care of the birds and they're not concerned about all of that stuff and God provides for them. So the instruction is, don't allow yourself to obsess over your needs, but trust Jehovah Jireh. Because many times, a lust for money stems from a foundation of real concerns about real needs that God's going to take care of anyway. No man can serve two masters. You find yourself consumed with money and, and, and worrying about money and desiring money and and you're consumed with that, what have you done? What have you done? You've made money your God. Now you have a, you see, no wonder the Bible tells us, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. You got to love God with everything. Now I appreciate money. I appreciate uh, what it accomplishes, what it does, what it allows me uh, the, the, the liberties and the freedoms, you know, it allows me to have. I can, I can uh, bless people like I want. I can, I can go places. I can do things. But trust and believe. My heart is towards God, period. Because no man can serve two masters. Never be in a position where it comes down to God or the, or the dollar. You got to think about it. Come on, man. God or the dollar, you got to think about it because you're torn. You're not really torn. Your heart is now stuck on money. There's, there, there, there's nothing to talk about. It comes down to God or the dollar, period. There's nothing to talk, talk about. Because many times you develop this lust for money out of real concerns about real needs. This is why you have to take everything to God. Now, uh, let's see. Letter B. Um, how do people get drawn into lust for money? Letter A, we said concerns about real needs. Letter B. Addicted, becoming addicted to riches. You know, money affords you certain luxuries and conveniences. And a lot of people get addicted to that stuff. I thank God that, you know, God allowed me to experience um, material things early in life. And I went through a time where I didn't have those things. And I was able to adjust because I don't, um, I don't classify myself based on what I have. It's who I am and it's because of whose I am. So if, you know, if it's after Hurricane Katrina and, and I have to go from, um, you know, the house of my dreams at the time 
to having to live in, um, I don't even remember the name of the little hotel, some little jive hotel, <laughs> some little jive hotel for two months, sleeping on a bed that was too hard. I was able to make that adjustment. I was able to go from riding high-end cars to driving Fords and Jeeps without a problem because I never got addicted to the things that money affords. So I can always make the adjustments in life because in every life you're, you're going to have some seasons of plenty and some lean seasons. You have to be able to make the adjustment, but there are a lot of you who've gotten addicted to riches and you've gotten addicted to certain lifestyles. And so now you just, all you think about is having more and more and more and more and more. And the Bible says in Luke chapter eight and verse 14, and that which fell among thorns, talking about, here's talking about why the word of God plants and works in some people's lives versus why it doesn't work or plant in other people's lives. And so read the whole context in your leisure. But here at verse 14 of Luke 8, it says, that which fell among thorns, talking about the seed of the word, some fell among thorns, are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares. Watch this. And riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. They're so addicted to riches that they can't even receive the word of God because their minds are consumed with the things that they have, the things they desire. So much so they can't tithe, they can't give, they can't bless the poor, they can't be a blessing to others because the word is choked out because of cares and riches. Now that's interesting that it says cares and riches. You have one group over here on this, this side to this extreme that are caught up in their needs. They can't, they can't receive the word because they're caught up in their needs. You got a group over here on this side, they can't receive the word because they're caught up in their abundance. Now, why again? Why again? How do people rather get drawn into lust for money? Concerns about needs, addicted to riches or conveniences or luxuries or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, I work, I work when God has blessed a, a man like God has blessed me. You have to work to make certain that you again, I learned this from my father. You have to work to make certain that you keep your feet on the ground and that you never allow your flesh to slip in through the back door. Um, recently, I, I told you all I went to Atlanta and we went to a certain hotel, Lisa and I. And man, I, I didn't like that hotel. It, it just wasn't, you know, wasn't what I was expecting. And so Lisa said, well, you know, you want me to call somewhere else and let's, let's move. Let's go. I said, no. I said, no, I'm going to stay right here. I said, because I'm sitting up here in a hotel room and there are people that are sleeping out there on the streets. I'm not going to allow my flesh to get so out of control that I don't learn how to make the adjustment. Come on now. Recently, I went somewhere and the hotel wasn't that great. And Lisa's always striving to make certain I'm comfortable. So she said now she at the time was all the way over in uh, the Middle East. And she said, well, you know, you, um, you want me to call and get you something else? I said, no, no. I said, I'm going to sit right here because it's a dangerous thing to keep yourself way up here and get knocked down. It's far better to keep your feet planted. In fact, land on your knees. Come on now. So that nothing that life throws at you throws you off because you're not addicted to this stuff. You understand that these things are, are blessings that God gives you, but you're not entitled to anything. If the season changes, you got to be able to sit like Job did and say, I'm waiting on God. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching better than y'all shouting. I'm waiting on God. 
and then let us see why, why or how is it that people get drawn into lust for money, concerns about needs, addicted to riches, or let us see, they revel in the sense of superiority. When you've had money for a certain amount of time, you actually may begin to feel like you're better than people who do not have it. And so your sense of um, esteem, your sense of worth and value are attached to how much money you have. So you lust after it because it's where your false sense of superiority lies. You know, if there's anything, if we've not learned anything of late uh, relative to the antics that have gone on in the world in the United States of America, we've learned that money does not equal class. We've learned that money does not equal value. Because there are a whole lot of multimillionaire and possibly billionaires who are classless. I'm preaching better than you all are shouting. But, but you see, when, when you've not had a proper relationship with money, you, you, you revel in the money because it gives you this false sense of superiority. They last time I checked, when we die, nothing we have goes back to the earth with us. The billionaire dies, they put his body in the ground or her body in the ground. Next to the homeless person that dies, they put both of those bodies are going to turn into what? Dust. Dust. But when you when you have the wrong relationship or the wrong mindset around money. It gives you this false sense of superiority. So you, you lust after it because that's where your sense of importance comes from. And in Proverbs 22 and 7, it says, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Some people love money because of how they can lord it over other people. You know, I hate to see people who, who have means and know other people need it and, and make people... Who, who need what you have, jump through hoops to get it. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing that angers me more than that. You know, God has blessed you, and now here you are holding it over other people's heads when you could just simply be a blessing. But it's where you find your what? It's where you find your sense of superiority. The rich rules over the poor. It's, it's a shame to see people with low self-esteem in high positions. Big bank accounts. Nothing smaller than a, than a man with a big bank account uh, and low self-esteem. He'll always use his means to belittle others. Now, um, looking at this thing relative to, you know, having the proper or having a wrong relationship with money, a few things that I jotted down. When we do have a wrong relationship with money, a few things that the Holy Spirit just kind of dropped in my heart that, that will happen. This is important because what God is preparing to drop in your life, now I hope you all are hearing what I'm saying prophetically, what God is preparing to drop into your life um, you're going to have to have the right relationship with money because God intends on you having a lot of it. Letter A, or number one rather, it makes you, when you have the wrong relationship with money, it will make you break covenant with your destiny. I, I look at... Um, you know, ministries that accomplish great things and go on to build great ministries that impact the world. And then you see 
too often where the leaders get drawn away by you know the blessings that that come along with being obedient to God and then it becomes less about ministry and it becomes all about that leaders um, you know financial gain not even not even necessarily a concern for the the financial well-being of the ministry as much as it is about just heaping upon himself more and more and more and more and before you know it they've broken covenant with God and they've divorced themselves from their own destiny. If you think I'm going to relinquish my destiny for a dollar, you have to be out of your mind. Because the last time I checked, I was, I was talking or teaching somewhere and I was saying to the people, um, God has blessed me to have just enough money, just enough to know what it feels like um, to get bored with buying stuff. How much stuff can you buy? I mean, you know, how many times can you go to the mall? How many, how many pairs of shoes can you put? And, and I mean, you know, anybody know me knows I love clothes and all of that. How many cars can you drive? How many cars can you drive? How many suits can you wear? I've discovered that the things that money affords, eventually when you've had so much of it, it becomes boring. Boring. But watch this, when you wake up every day in and on and for purpose, purpose never gets boring. Helping people, empowering people, never gets boring. Leaving a legacy in the earth never gets boring. So if you think I would swap my destiny for dollars, you don't know me very well. Because when I'm gone, nobody's going to care anything about what he drove, what kind of house he lived in, how much money he had. <laughs> Maybe my children and my grandchildren care about how much money I had. But beyond that, ain't nobody going to care nothing about that. That's not going to live on beyond me. But what I do for God in the earth, if I fulfill my destiny, those are the things that will cause my name to be like my late father's name. People talk about my father like he's still here. And it's, it's going on nine years in a few days that my father transitioned and went to heaven. Nine years. And people still talk about him. And they talk emotionally about him. They cry when they mention him. They don't talk about what kind of house he had or how much money he had. They don't talk about those things. They talk, they talk about how he impacted their lives. But my dad always had a proper relationship with money. Dad never allowed money to break his covenant with God. He always kept money in its proper place. And that is he viewed it as a tool to fulfill purpose and to bless people. That's what he did. And as a consequence, God blessed him supernaturally. God blessed him supernaturally. You know, I'm so proud to, to be his son and his namesake, my God. You know, we've started so many churches, should I say dad started so many churches and all of those churches were started really out of dad's personal funds. All of those churches were started. Some have gone on, we released and they've gone on in good standing and grace and all of that to do their own thing. But those churches were started out of the personal bank account of Robert Charles uh, Blake Sr. and Lois Blake's. And I watched my father have the proper relationship with money. And God blessed him, man. People would put thousands of dollars in his hands. Dad blessed the poor. God Almighty. Dad put people through school. Dad bought people houses. Dad bought people cars. Because he always kept a proper relationship with money. He never let money become his God. So it never caused him to break covenant with destiny. If you go to 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 20 through 27, 
It's talking about a brother here by the name of Gehazi, who's working as an understudy to Elisha, but missed his destiny because he got greedy eyes. And it says there in 2 Kings 5, 20 through 27, but Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God said, behold, my master hath spared Naaman, his, this Syrian. Give me, let me give you the backdrop. Naaman came to see the prophet. He had leprosy. The prophet spoke over him, said, do X, Y, Z. God's going to heal your leprosy. Naaman did it. And God healed the leprosy. He, Naaman wanted to give the prophet some money. The prophet said, I don't need nothing from you. His servant Gehazi is listening. And so now here we go. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God said, behold, he runs and catches Naaman as he gets down the road behind the back of Elisha. Behold, my master hath spared Naaman this Syrian. I'm not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, is all well? And he said, all is well. My master hath sent me saying, behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Naaman said, be content, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house, hid them in the house and he let the men go and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master and Elisha said unto him, whence comest thou Gehazi? And he said, thy servant went nowhere. And he said unto him, went not mine heart with thee? When the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee, is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vine yards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence, a leper as white as snow. This boy missed his destiny. Elisha served Elijah. The mantle fell on him. Gehazi was serving Elisha. I believe that mantle was supposed to fall on Gehazi. But when you read the story of Elisha, the anointing was still on Elisha's bones in the grave because he didn't have anyone to transfer it to because Gehazi stepped out of his destined position because of money. Close. Now, number two, when you have a wrong relationship with money, it makes you, it can turn you into a traitor. Man, you know how many people are betraying people that love them for money? Turning, I mean, turning on people, selling people out for a few dollars, money. This is why I say to you, man, you got to really take your time and test the people that you let into your life. Don't just let people run up into your life because, man, some people go, for, go to the highest bidder. Everybody's not loyal. Some people go to the highest bidder. And I'm not in, you know, I don't want anybody to think I'm in reference to anybody because I'm, God knows I'm not. I'm not thinking about anything, partic anybody in particular. I'm just thinking about how life is unfolded. You, you have to really be careful because when people don't have a right relationship with money, they will betray you. For a few dollars, they will betray you. You know, how do you think people get all of this information on uh, movie stars and, and, and politicians where they are. Oh my God, my, my, my. You know, I, I was, the, the Holy Spirit was just teaching me some time ago about, you know, can't nobody stab you in your back unless they're close. 
you know, people that, that's way over there, you know, they can't hurt you. But it, the people that stab you in your back are the ones that get close. Somebody offer them a few dollars, they'll stab you in your back. You, how many women? Okay, let me get in trouble for a few minutes here. How many women have betrayed great men because somebody came along with a shinier car? You, you, you've walked off from a great husband because another dude comes by with money. Now let me, let me, let me take a minute to just thank God for my wife. You know, when I told Lisa that I wasn't getting married and she should move on, she moved on. And she moved on to a wealthy guy. She, you know, she, I, was, I was a little broke preacher. I was broke. She moved on to a wealthy guy. But when I called her and said, hey, the Lord said, you're my wife. She dropped that and came back to me, even though my wallet wasn't as big as that dude's. Now she's lived. I'm preaching better than y'all shouting. But when you, when you have a wrong relationship with money, it can turn you into a traitor. Go to Matthew chapter 26. I pause like that because some of you all need to ponder that. You know, you're engaging in conversations about people. Um, you're, making, you're making some old funny looking moves, you know, that uh, don't look like loyalty. And you're doing it for what? The Bible says in Matthew 26, 14 through 16, says, then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests and said unto them, what will you give me and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. When you have the wrong relationship with money, man, it will make you betray your best friend. Some of you have betrayed your own mothers for money. You betrayed your own father, siblings, friends, pastors for money. At a certain point, you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? You know, all of this stuff you're doing for money, is it, is it worth it at the end of the day? When you leave a trail of broken souls behind you for that, uh, number three, number three, it can cost you when you have an improper relationship with money, it can cost you your soul. You will get all of the money, but you can't sleep at night. You got all of the money, but you, you, you got to pop pills for anxiety. It can cost you your soul. If you go to uh, Mark chapter 8 and 36, it says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What good is that? What, what good is it to get all of this stuff? And man, let me tell you something. Can I just be completely, totally transparent and honest with you? I can live in a mansion. Or I can live in an apartment. I can drive a Rolls Royce or I can drive a Hoopty. Those things don't matter. What matters to me is that my soul is right with God. If you go to Luke chapter 12, 
it can cost you your soul. Some of y'all around here running behind money so much, man, you're going to mess around, die, and go to hell. You're going to mess around here, die, and go to hell. Sitting up in the church, all you can think about, talk about, is money. You're doing all kind of dirty stuff to get it. And you're going to mess around and die and go to hell. Listen to what the Bible says in Luke 12, 16 through 20. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? This dummy didn't even understand the purpose of the prosperity. It was to bless him to make him a blessing. He thought, I ain't got nowhere to put my stuff. And he said, this I will do. Listen to this genius. I will pull down my barns and build greater. My, my barns are too small, so I'm going to build bigger ones so I can hold more. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night... Your soul shall be required of you. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? What good is it to have a bank account full of money, die out of the will of God? We have a dear heart that um, one of our seniors that whose roof has been... Um, in disrepair since the last storm in New Orleans. I forget the name of that, so I don't try to remember all the names of those storms. But her roof has been in disrepair. She doesn't have the insurance to do it and all of that kind of thing. And so the Lord told me and Lisa, well, the Lord told me and I told Lisa and she agreed that we are to fix her roof for her. Lisa and I, not the church, but Lisa and I. So I called the contract, the contractor went and met her, and the um, contractor's gonna get her roof fixed uh, in, a, in a few days, and I'm gonna pay for that. Because that is the purpose of God blessing. God, God blesses us to make us a blessing, not, not, not to store it up, not to heap it up, and, and to, you know, just, just constantly taking it in, taking it in, taking it in, no, 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 no. God wants to make you a distribution center, but you got to have the right relationship with money because if you don't, you make it a God and you look around and it'll cost you your soul. You got to be willing to, to, to part with it. If you're not willing to part with money, you have made it a God. And let me tell you something. Every time I make a move like that, a boss move like that. When I say boss, man, I'm talking about somebody that's a kingdom boss. You know what I mean? You're just in a position where God's saying, okay, let me see if I can trust you on this level. Let me see if I can trust you on this level. Every time I make a boss move like that, God brings me higher. God brings me higher. I'm able to be a blessing. I'm able to take care of my church. I'm able to take care of my family. Come on, somebody. Because I have a right relationship with money. When I get to the point where I'm holding on and I can't do what God told me to do with what God gave me. I've made a God of that money and I, I'm running the, the danger of losing my soul behind a dollar. Now, what are the righteous purposes of money? Let me give you this and then I'm out. Money is for security. God, God blesses us with resources. He blesses us with money that we might have security. Ecclesiastes 7 and 12 says, for wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. That's the purpose of money, to protect you and to guard you from calamity. And the term defense is a masculine noun meaning a shade or a shadow, a covering. This word is frequently used as a symbol for protection or refuge. God gives you money to protect you and to cover you from certain things. And that's how I view it now. That's why when you're a wise person, you don't spend it all. 
because you understand that God gives it to you, that it might be a defense for you in times of difficulty. That was the whole purpose of, of Joseph and Pharaoh. He said, look, we, we got to store up, store up so that when when the difficult times come, you have you have a covering, you have a shade, you have a financial refuge. Money is for security. Money is designed to cover you in life's crisis. Because if you have none, you are exposed. Now you have to do what? Beg those who have. God never wanted you, never desired for you to be in that position. And the Bible says in Proverbs 10 and 15, the rich man's wealth is his strong city. The, the destruction of the poor is their poverty. Number two, righteous, righteous purposes of money. Money is a testimony of your stewardship. You know what kind of steward you are in the kingdom of God by how you know you manage your money. God recently told me to, not only did he tell me to take care of the bill for that, for my, my, my baby's roof at our house, and y'all know what those roofs are causing now down in New Orleans. But God also told me to sow a $5,000 seed. Mm. Because the way you handle your money is the clearest indication of your personal stewardship. Ecclesiastes 9 and 16 says, Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. When you have money, it's a testimony to the world, or should I say, it allows the world to listen to you and your testimony. In most cases, when people are strapped financially, it's a sign of poor stewardship. At least that's the way the world sees it. And in Matthew 25, 14 through 28, oh, that's a lot of verses. He says, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. <laughs> Y'all just sit in and let me read it. Who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents to another two, to another one. To every, I won't read all that. Y'all know, the, all know the, the parable of the talents. And, and, and he concluded that two of them were righteous and good stewards based on what they did with what they had. And he concluded that one was wicked because of what he did with what he had. He did not increase it, so he called him wicked. He just hid his, and he called him wicked. Because what you do with money is the greatest indication of your actual stewardship. And the reason the rich continue to get richer many times is because they respect the laws of money, which makes them what? Great stewards of money. See, if you always need a financial miracle every six months, three months you need a financial miracle, you're not a good steward of money. God keeps bringing you out, bring, pulling you through, and every three months you need another financial miracle, you're not a good steward of money. Number three, righteous purposes of money. Money is God's window to the heart. God is looking at your heart and you're able to see your heart clearly, clearly based on how you handle money. In Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, it says, And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth, I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of her punery hath cast in all the living that she had. It was a reflection of her heart. And Matthew 6, 21 says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then watch this. Money is designed to manifest vision. God gives you money to manifest vision. Matthew or Luke 14, 28 says, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first 
and counted the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it. Money, the, one of the major purposes of money is to fund vision. Ecclesiastes 10, 19, feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry, but money answers all things. Listen to how it reads in the message version. Laughter and bread go together and wine gives sparkle to life, but it's money that makes the world go around. You need money to fulfill vision. So as you endeavor to develop a righteous relationship with money, my prayer is that some of these things that I've shared with you will aid you and that you too will come to a place where God can trust you with great because you've been faithful over little. We here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you for spending this time with us today. R.C. and Lisa are always honored to have you with us. Don't forget to reach out to us by visiting our website at www.rcblakes.com. While you're there, you may join our mailing list and receive a free download of the Laws of Manifesting Your Vision by R.C. Blakes. Also look at all of the online programs by R.C. You may find all books written by R.C. and Lisa. Once again, all of us here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And as we always say, see you at the top.